Designing green, it seems, is not enough. The green movement asked that we do less harm by improving the performance of our buildings, neighborhoods, and cities. But the time for incremental change has passed. Whatever has been achieved so far is less than the damage done to ecosystems around us. There is an emerging view that we must take a big step forward. We must actively repair and restore the natural world that we inhabit. This film documents a journey through Asia. It reveals a new worldview affecting design. What emerges from this worldview is a fundamental rethink of the built environment. Buildings, parks and cities are seen to mimic nature. They become partners with nature. The term ecopuncture describes these acts of regeneration, designs that seek to restore systemic health and create ripples of goodness. The interviews ahead were taped as part of research for a book documenting ecopuncture in Asia. This is a first-hand account of new ideas in some of the most crowded and challenging cities seen anywhere. Everything starts with ecology. My contention is that the human built environment, the human made world, has to be remade and redesigned and reinvented as hybrid proxy ecosystems. Ecological design aims to, should aim to making a built and a human made world to be like nature. To be like nature with regard to buildings means it has to be like ecosystems. It has to emulate, it has to mimic the properties of ecosystems. The humankind has now basically taken over many of the systems in the world. We're now in this kind of custodial or management role. We need to deal with these problems within the city. And of course, buildings as the major component of the city, buildings and infrastructure, basically. Both these elements can actually support ecosystems and provide ecosystem services if they're designed appropriately. Environmental science and the public awareness have advanced so much that we do have concrete evidence and knowledge to avoid some of the mistakes that the developed countries had to go through it's much easier to make informed decisions to balance the give and the take between the need for development and the need to regulate. We inherited a, a huge wisdom about how to deal with water, how to deal with land resources, how to feed such a big population with minimal resources. The ecology is essential. You following the natural rhythm or following the natural pattern to create a new form. This is the art of survival. As a species, we consume 40% of available energy on the planet, more than 50% fresh water. Our ecological footprint has overshot Earth's biocapacity by 70%. What happens in the fast-growing economies of Asia has a direct impact on what happens at the planetary scale. Of the 20 cities worldwide that since 2000 grew the fastest, 12 were in China. China and India today make up a third of the world's population and a quarter of global economic output. And these figures, in absolute and relative terms, are projected to grow. The global economy spurred by growth in Asia is expected to quadruple by 2050. 
There are forces of urbanization that have huge impacts on natural resources, and you have this innate conflict between large populations of humans living in these cities and natural areas, which in parts have been untouched for centuries and in parts have been very highly manipulated by man, by agricultural processes and so on. What's different about what's happening in Asia is the sheer quantity of things involved. So it becomes an issue of enormous numbers of people and densities that haven't been imagined or solved in the cities of the developed West. We were used to dealing with cities for quite a while, which are only fairly manageable size, maybe three to five million. But we are now talking about mega cities, which are 10 million people and above. In China itself, we have hyper mega cities that are actually 30 million to 100 million people. There are three kinds of Asian cities. There's the older cities like Tokyo or Singapore, which are fairly stable in population and they're doing quite well in terms of being well planned. Then there are the rapidly growing cities of China. Those ones tend to be basically post-war planning from Europe and America that's being implemented. And that planning was really designed to solve a different set of problems. And the third kind are really the cities that are expanding bottom-up with no real effective planning policies and they're just exploding populations, ad hoc growth without infrastructure. We think there's a real problem that needs to be solved in terms of how you do with these numbers and how you can deliver them some kind of appropriate and enjoyable quality of life in a city at super high density. Human beings have done terrible things to the environment. Affected the climate, affected the ecology, affected the ecosystems, affected the aquatic environment. We have gone past the thresholds of what nature can withstand. These thresholds are what they call resilience and the carrying capacities of the ecological systems and of the biogeochemical cycles in nature. Rapid economic expansion in Asia has come at human and ecological costs. Between 1983 and 2002, the city of Bandung on the island of Java in Indonesia tripled in size. Industrial areas increased almost 100-fold and the forest cover halved. Untreated wastewater is discharged directly into the waterways. Sitarum, the river that runs through the Bandung basin, is one of the most polluted rivers in the world. Human being now is disconnecting with nature. Vietnamese uh, city like Ho Chi Minh or Hanoi became very big. Near 10 million people living in the city. The problem is we are losing the nature, the greenery. Even we polluted the river, the air. We don't have any green space. For example, in Ho Chi Minh, now the green area is only 0.25% of the whole area of the city is green. Almost smallest in the world. As the city of Mumbai grappled with problems of urban expansion and social equity, it lost more than a third of its forests and wetlands. Water bodies shrunk by 12%, agricultural land by 40%. The degradation of water networks in particular came into focus in 2005 with a devastating flood that paralyzed the city, resulting in the death of over a thousand people. The cause of the flood was traced to the Mithi River. Since 1966, the hydrological system of the Mithi has been systematically compromised. The number of ponds and lakes in its catchments have halved, the river's width in places has been reduced by 50%. Up to two-thirds of the nalas and streams that flow into the river 
have been reclaimed for development. In over 30 years development, urbanization, industrialization, China or Chinese cities have destroyed the environment. So we have problems of urban flooding and inundation. We have problem of soil pollution. We have problem of air pollution, despair of biodiversity. We are facing ecological crisis. 50% of wetland and species disappeared in the past 50 years in China. 75% of water is polluted in China. How can you solve the problem by sewage plant? We need a more effective, more inexpensive, and more multifunctional landscape approach to deal with this polluted water. All these are ecological issues about survival for the people and nature itself. To find an answer, many designers expand the question. Sustainability as a goal cannot be reached by breaking problems into smaller problems and then fixing them one at a time. Fragmentation destroys the whole, and wholeness is the essence of life. We need to see the relationship of parts, how these parts come together. And this calls for a systems approach, one that sees the environment as multiple interacting layers that are bound together by the flows and exchanges of energy, water and materials. Through this, it becomes possible to engage both human-made and natural systems at all scales, from buildings to neighbourhoods, habitats to watersheds. And with this, we can create room not only for what humans need, but for all life. The thing about nature is that everything's connected. So everything that you do at one scale affects what happens at a larger scale. And what happens you do at a larger scale affects things at the, at the uh, micro scale. So you have to look at scales in nature from the macro down to meso, down to the micro, down to the nano. But you can't do things without affecting something else. By being systems thinkers, we're looking at how these larger systems react to one another and fit into the context of their given condition. Those systems might be environmental systems, the interrelationship of various ecosystems, or it could be related to society and social conditions. The point is that they are all connected. Humans and nature share this planet and they are irrevocably intertwined. There's a very typical, I mean, understanding of uh, what kind of a sustainable building should it looks like. And uh, it's a very much technological solution. It's, it's like a solar panel, like a windmill. Artificial lighting, most important, is the smallest envelope. But in my project, we promote a kind of a nature ways of living. So nature ventilation, nature lighting. Sustainability is not about the technology. Sustainability is related to the interaction of our ways of living and the particular environments. Kutek Pot Hospital is one of eight acute care hospitals in Singapore. It is predicated on the idea of a healing environment, which links the well-being of its occupants to the physical attributes of the building. The heart of the hospital is an open-to-sky court filled with dense green cover. What differentiates this from others is its generosity and openness. The water systems connect to wider hydrological systems in the catchment. The green spaces inside the court are linked to greenery in the neighbourhood creating a hotspot that attracts birds from nearby nature reserves. 
The public spaces of the hospital have become a social hub for the neighborhood. In a recent study, some 15% of all who were surveyed on hospital grounds said they had come for social and recreational reasons. Volunteers, mostly retirees from the neighborhood, tend to rooftop farms, and the food grown here is sold at weekend markets. Since it opened in 2010, the hospital has altered the urban and natural ecosystems around it. There are new pathways for pedestrians, new biophilic spaces for relaxation, new lines of movement for birds and butterflies. is not we design a building and we put the green on like decoration but we design a greenery at the main part of the the, the building for example farming kindergarten it around one hour from the Ho Chi Minh city center it next to the shoe factory with 20,000 worker this kindergarten for the worker children we have three courtyards connecting together. We connect the three courtyards to the roof farming. We do the farm on top of the building for introducing the agriculture to the children. Then we also ask their parents to join the process of making farming on the top, to enjoy with their children there and their children can have vegetable to eat when they are in school. Our country is agriculture culture. What we would like to do is we reintroduce to them again a way they can enjoy their life. For about 18 years, we've been looking at ways of incorporating greenery on the roofs and other areas of buildings. And then a few years ago, we thought, once we've got this sort of infrastructure of life-bearing areas of the building, you can actually think a little more strategically about what that might be. This greenery could perform other services such as food and vegetables or supporting ecosystems. I think as a whole, great and exciting new avenue to think about designing for life rather than just designing for humans. Oasia Hotel Downtown is a 27-storey mixed-use development comprising commercial component of offices and hotel component above the offices. It's an almost 200 meter tall tower, which has only a footprint of 45 meters, but we had a lot of vertical surfaces. And with these vertical surfaces, we managed to create a living facade where it actually allows creepers, shrubs, and trees on the horizontal level as well to become a ecosystem for animals, and particularly for climbing animals. With a post-construction survey and audit, we have found animals able to moving on to the building itself. So we realized that if the buildings of this nature were next to parks, we could extend the urban habitat substantially. What we found in, in terms of applying these uh, aspirations uh, to our projects is that uh, they can't be solved as sort of bolt-on additions, but there's something that has to really 
be integrated into the way the project is strategically organised from the very beginning. We have to sort of roll back a little bit and again from first principles say these new things that we're trying to do, what conditions do they need and how can we achieve that through form. Sometimes we joke that if a plant is not eaten by an animal or insect, then the plant is not doing its job in the nature. To me, the philosophy is that a landscape should work with the nature. If you're designing a stereo landscape that is just for people to look at without any functions, then it's too single dimensioned. Often if you look at the landscape that we are designing, they perform multiple functions at multiple scales. It could be social, it could be aesthetic, or ecological. So the true robust and sustainable landscapes should be a combination of its functions, uh, social well-beings, and various benefits to the society. I call my approach the art of survival. Planning and design based on ecology. Deep form have two dimensions. One dimension is the pattern, or the configurative deep form to define where's the nature, where's the city, or where's the settlement. The so river systems, wetland systems, the natural forest. So these will provide ecological surfaces. Production, provision, regulating flood and drought. The second dimension is the shape of culture itself. So it's overlapped. Underneath is the nature ecology. Above is a cultural aspect like the terraces is a mountain. You cannot separate culture from nature. So it's draped over the natural system. In Shanghai Houghton Park, we learned from the Chinese terraces. It was a site of the Shanghai 2010 Expo. So it is a demonstration of how can we use the ecological approach to clean the water instead of using gray sewage plant to clean the water. The nutrient-rich water from Huangpujiang River will be used following the terraces and the nutrient, the nitrogen and the potassium can be removed by different species of plants. And also in the process of removing of the nutrient or the pollutants, we also have a productive landscape. We can produce food, we can produce all kinds of nutritious vegetation, and this vegetation can be recycled as fertilizer again. Ecology and ecosystems are beginning to be discussed in Asia as a counterpoint to growth and urbanization. But the goodwill of a few designers and developers is not enough to create transformation at the scale that is really needed. Policy must push this along. It must incentivize and encourage positive outcomes. And for this to happen, there must be a shift in the way that we define value. The emphasis on economic growth and financial capital must expand to include social, natural, and human capitals. We think a kind of process requires a few pieces of the puzzle to come together. The first one is prototypes. Unless you've actually managed to build something, everyone has a million reasons why it can't be done, why it's impossible. Once you have the prototype, that changes many people's minds and they start thinking about how it could be done. And then policy steps in. Once you have policy that says you must do this, then it becomes a technical issue. You know, how do you achieve this? And then you get people coming in, specialist contractors or consultants, who help people achieve this result. And then you tend to get market acceptance and market-driven requirement for this. People say, oh, my building's so old-fashioned, it doesn't have any sky garden. Next time we move, I want to move somewhere where there's a park on the roof. China is unique in Asia in that they're able to implement policy very quickly and on a large scale. 
For example, the idea of sponge cities, these landscapes that can take on incredible amounts of flood water. That's not a concept or a policy that was ever discussed in a nationwide debate in Western countries. But in China, you have central government policy dictating how cities look at receiving stormwater. That's a huge potential for a shift in how places are designed and how the landscape architect's role has a significant impact in shaping these cities. In the past 10 years, the Chinese government has made a tremendous progress in transforming the policy from development-oriented policy towards protection-oriented policy. And I personally have a significant impact on these policies. We have national zoning policy. We have national land use policy. We have regional and county level land use policy. And we have this uh, ecological red line policy. And we also have this sponge city movement, sponge city campaign. Now every city wants to have an ecological recovery for their wetland, for the river system, and every city wants to become a green city. Yan Weizhou is located in Jinghua City in Zhejiang Province. It's inspired by the Chinese farming technique to create flood adaptable landscape or resilient landscape. We deliberately remove the concrete wall. We transform the gray industrial infrastructure and replace with terraces of vegetated landscape. We build this park in the center of the city. Before, the city was separated by two rivers and we built a bridge across the two rivers. And because of the recovery of the ecological green heart in the center, now this park become a meeting place. The bridge become a public space connecting the separated city. It become a catalyst socially, culturally, and economically. Because you will see the property value increase dramatically you will see people meeting every day across the river on the bridge, and also because you will see people consider this place as their cultural identity. So all these deep form landscape are inspired by the Chinese wisdom. This Chinese wisdom being revived or being upgraded to solve today's urban problem. Ecological landscape not only solves the ecological problem, but also have cultural, social, and economical benefits. We're very interested in our buildings actually being good and doing good on multiple levels. So we came up with this index called the Civic Generosity Index. And this actually measures if the building was a person, what kind of good and civil and kind and generous and contributing kind of person they would be. So it's basically a building that contributes positively to the life of the city, to the ecosystem of the city. And we had a great response actually, like a lot of planning authorities when we presented the idea to them, they go, this, <laughs> this is what we want. Kampong Admiralty is a good example for how we could regenerate our cities. Where it actually works here is that we've been able to use our ideas of multiple ground levels in a club sandwich to facilitate a few important strategies in the building. We were able to layer in a very public layer on the ground level where we were able to create a very large tropical community space for the precinct. And using the second layer, which was the medical center, we were able to provide a very large cover, a shade and shelter for this public space that could be actually facilitated to as a 24-hour all-weather public space. And above that, we actually would have a last layer, which would be the community park, a semi-public private park for the residents, which would be for elderly housing. This is a social mixed-use housing project, and it was a good demonstration of how we could actually regenerate our cities through three-dimensional planning within the two-dimensional traditional city planning.
To visualize change, we need to challenge our preconceptions. Oganonandi is a small residential community on the outskirts of Hyderabad in India, which promised its buyers an escape from the stress of urban living. There was here a second promise of a kinder and gentler lifestyle. The old idea of the gated community of rich persons living behind a fence would be questioned. This began with the vision that Ogano would generate a substantial amount of what it needed on site food, energy, and water. For this to happen, it needed a different kind of social structure, one that creates symbiosis between residents and the farming community at large. About 75% of the estate land is pooled into community farms. Farmers are invited to work on this alongside residents. Training workshops are organized on newer and safer techniques of agriculture. The food that is produced is shared by all. Residents get safe food and a healthier lifestyle. Farmers have an added source of income and new knowledge on organic farming. With increases in social, human and economic capitals, natural capital was also generated. The water table, for instance, has been restored a new habitat for biodiversity has been created. I think it's important to understand that when a landscape is born, it's just beginning its lifespan. It's going to grow and mature and become richer and more nuanced over time. It's about the process of nature that you're observing and not how pretty it looks initially. It's about discovering beauty in different ways, ways that you have not been visually exposed to before in the context of landscapes that have been presented to you throughout your life. For example, in Jardin Park, we're defining the forest edge to make them more socially welcoming and desirable. It might be more managed, but the interior parts of the urban forest could be messier and even disorderly, which we try to discourage regular visitors to enter. So it becomes a safe haven for birds and other wildlife. Once socially accepted, it becomes a different type of landscape and people can use it as an educational opportunity to observe what a really messy and the natural state of the forest might evolve over time. It might look a little messy this year, but it might be stabilized the next year. But it's really important to accept the processes as a norm for the natural environment. Actually, a well-functioning ecosystem is almost the most enjoyable environment to be in. So for us, it's a win-win situation. We can create substantial ecosystems in the city. People are happier, people are healthier. The air is cleaner. We're using less energy, which in the end will translate to economic savings as well. So it really, it seems like a no-brainer right thing to do. I think the difficulty is just dealing with the status quo and with inertia and with conservative ideas about what can be done or what should be done. We must undo the damage that has been done. We must define what is important to our survival. And we must bring wholeness back. Design must become a way of imitating and engaging nature. Can our buildings cool the air? Can the park clean water? Can a neighborhood act like a forest, creating life-sustaining flows? Even our most successful projects are you know, only a fraction of the way towards self-sufficiency. But it is an urgent issue, and I think it does really change the way you conceptualize a project. We're really looking at how we can perform at the highest level for food, energy and water and how we can strategize to release the most effective areas for these to those objectives. I hope that if we provide examples of being able to 
do good and do well, that other people will find it easier to join in because whatever we do, we're never going to do more than a handful of projects. And so it needs numbers, it needs statistical significance, and it needs things to be connected together and to work collectively to get a big result. What determines the socio-economic political systems is human ideology. So everything starts with a mindset. At the end of the day, what needs to be changed is humanity's mindset, humanity's ideology to be a nature-centric driven approach. Everyone wants their city to be sponge city and everyone wants their city to be green and ecological cities. And that's why it's important now for us, for professionals, for professors, for school to match this huge campaign to able to support these policies to promote eco-civilization. The full designer is a kind of professional service provider. But now you can be much more proactive we can be an agent of positive social changes. So this is a new law of design. And to make that happen, designers need to have a new capacity, not only professional skills, but also have a mission and a new vision and also capability of making things happen. For us, it's something more about doing the right thing, about actually sort of doing good. It's the kind of core of our practice that we want to leave the Earth at least no worse off and hopefully in a better position than we found it. The projects and ideas seen in this film are exceptions to the rule. Despite their success, there is no widespread replication. They do, however, suggest a different kind of a future, one in which we actively restore wholeness. Restoring wholeness, we discover, is not only necessary, it can be beautiful and meaningful to our everyday lives. Imagine a thousand Kutepot hospitals, hutan parks, farming kindergartens, in hundreds of cities across Asia. Imagine ripples from each, transforming neighborhoods and ecosystems. Just as we now suffer the consequences of a thousand bad decisions made without foresight, imagine a world of a thousand good ones made with a little systemic insight.